Hi, hey everybody at the Cloud Native Security Conference. Welcome. Today we're going to discuss from theory to practice with Sean Anderson, myself, Anna McTaggart, and Michael Hackett. Here we are. And Michael Hackett and I are at Red Hat. I'm a security analyst, and he is a principal product experience engineer. Sean Anderson is a PhD student at Portland State University with a focus on formal methods. So here's a little thing. This is actually from practice to theory. The title was created prior to this decision. We're going to be starting off for clarity of this talk, the practical security used in SAF, the flaws with those methods, and a better way with theory. We're going to start off by discussing Rook for SAF, moving into the shortfalls of this current practice and other security features with SAF. And we're going to show how theory and in particular formal methods will help us fix these flaws. And I'm going to hand it over to Michael Hackett now. Thanks, Anna. So before we get into the practical security side of, of, of Rook Ceph, I'd, I'd like to just give a quick overview on, on why we're, we're talking about Rook Ceph today, right? Um, we all know from a development standpoint that looking at deploying cloud native applications it can be extremely complex and challenging when, when, we're, when we're looking at it from the outside in, right? Large clouds, um, large number of compute um, can, can lead to a, a very overwhelming situation. So why we're looking at Rook Ceph is because we're, we're, we're simplifying the underlying storage aspect and allowing our developers or our, our, our end customers to focus on writing applications and, and, and testing code. What we've done with Rook Ceph is we've basically designed an, um, a way to automate packaging, deployment, cluster management, upgrading, and, and scaling of, of, of storage um, all underneath the stateful applications, as well as providing infrastructure services such as, as an area to provide logging and metrics and, and registry to Kubernetes clusters. Um, we do this by augmenting Kubernetes, by giving them access to storage services, including block, file system, and object storage. Anna, you can go to the next slide. Cool. So, so why are we focusing on Rook Ceph, right? Um, Working at Red Hat, we can see the container adoption is just exploding throughout our customers. Um, more and more businesses are looking at using Kubernetes buzzwords <laughs> as ways to, to uh, automate and drive automation, um, just improve overall efficiency with their teams, um, and, and, and just be able to, 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 to scale at, 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 um, at, at need be without the, the requirements of, of going out and purchasing these, these large storage arrays. Um, the trouble that we have with cloud native environments, uh, which we're looking to cover here, is is how do we actually secure and protect this data, all this data that's going in here? Um, this we don't want to leave this to the development engineer to, in in order to figure this out. So we need to have these these um, these these features in place that are able to provide the, the, this type of um, security and protection for the data that resides in, in our Kubernetes clusters. Go ahead, uh, go to the next slide, please. So where are we currently at with Rook? Um, Rook gives us the ability to, to auto scale itself and also auto heal itself when, when we're facing any type of underlying hardware failure or, or something that may impact the underlying cluster situation or, or, or data access for our end users. There's no requirement to go in there and, and um, re recover a failed object storage daemon yourself. The, the Rook operator automatically goes out there um, restarts the pod for you. So we're dealing with a, a, a self-healing cluster where the developer doesn't have to take his time uh, a, a, away from moving forward on, on any of his application work uh, to, to troubleshoot an issue and, and um, auto-recover the cluster, um, self-recover the cluster. This is auto done all from um, uh, the, the, the Rook Ceph operator. We're also allowing um, Ceph, which can be a complex storage product, to run on our Kubernetes platform with ease via the Rook Ceph operator. This is enabling the benefits of, of containerization and the ease of using containers um, um, and push that down to our developers. The ease of using containers is obvious. It gives us the, the, the auto packaging, the, the auto upgrade, and, and, and those types of features that I discussed in the previous slide. Looking at uh, security from a practical standpoint, we can apply these from, from OpenShift to our Rook Ceph clusters, and we can implement these based upon a individual YAML file or in your CRDs uh, specified for each one of your, um, your, your resources. A CRD is a custom resource definition. Um, in Ceph standalone, outside of Kubernetes, um, 
you, when you're when you're dealing with these types of, of of changes to any of the security policies or or features inside Ceph, it's usually a a, a very manual process where you update the configuration um, and then push out to a set of nodes. Um, that's a manual configuration. When we're dealing with Ceph um, and, and the Rook Ceph operator, we're still dealing with somewhat of a manual configuration here, but uh, it's it's a a a, a lot less um, overhead than it would be if we're dealing with a, a a Ceph cluster outside, a bare metal Ceph cluster outside of Kubernetes. And you can go to the next slide, please. So addressing a little bit where, more where we are from the practical side of, of security with Ceph, um, I want to go over a little bit of, of what we're currently offering. Um, we, can act, we can deploy our object storage daemons, which are your, your underlying data storage devices in Ceph. Uh, we can deploy these as being encrypted uh, using DMCrypt during the OSD's creation. Uh, these can be done in, in multiple different ways using Lux. Uh, this can be done on the, the actual device layer, or we can do it on the LVM ab abstraction layer. Um, as of our, our Nautilus release, um, we're actually supporting external KMS um, via HashiCorp being the only KMS server that, that, um, that we're, that we're um, supporting currently, and that was made available with the 1.5 release. Um, this, the, the way that we, we, we set encryption on these OSDs uh, does need to be uh, applied manually. So this isn't an, an, an automated constraint that can be done or something that can be done to an OSD that's already online, unfortunately. Um, this is done by updating a respected uh, storage uh, class device, YAML or template, and setting your encryption value to true. Um, by default, this is stored in Kubernetes secret, um, which uh, from a security standpoint isn't as, as um, as secure as I, I would, I would that, that would be fit for a certain um, requirements for users, which is why we introduced support for the external KMS HashiCorp vault, when a requirement is for the key to live outside of Kubernetes and on an external um, uh, vault device. We also in, in Nautilus released um, something called the V2 Messenger Protocol. So what the V2 Messenger Protocol is, it, it actually introduces encryption on the wire. When we're talking the, the encrypted level of OSDs, we're talking data at rest encryption. What we're doing with the V2 Messenger is actually encrypting data that is running through the network. Um, and, and this is done utilizing our, our own Ceph authentication system called CephX. Um, so what we do there is, is, is there is a, a, a default method called CRC check, which basically uh, sets a valid CRC on, on traffic flowing through the, the, the network and validates it when we reach an, an additional endpoint. CRC check is the, the default method of, of V2 Messenger that we use, but there is also a secure setting, which is a, a, a more in-depth full encryption of all the, 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 the traffic going through. So we were looking at a full cryptographic integrity check of the traffic running through the network. Um, this requires a, also a, a manual editing setting of the cluster CRD during the cluster creation. So we can't just turn on secure mode during um, uh, the, the, the cluster being up and running. This is a setting that, require, that, that is required to be set while the cluster is, is, is in creation. This, this is done um, by, by defining um, your, your cluster CRD. Another area that, that, that we look at in Ceph from a security standpoint is actually the ability to modify user permissions per pools. Uh, this, is, this is giving certain users read, write, um, or, or executive access to any of the pools. This can be configured by setting a, a, the, the client custom resource definition for a specific client. Uh, looking at this primarily for, for LibRBD use cases, for example, OpenStack running on OpenShift, um, where we may have a registry or something like that, where a user may, may be um, required permissions to, to access specific pools. But um, it, it, there are also other use cases, for example, your, your, um, your Radios Gateway or Object Store User CRD can also be set to, to specify specific users to, to access different sets of object store pools on, uh, on the underlying Ceph cluster as well. So that, 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 that's currently, uh, from the, the, the tactical standpoint, what we're offering right now from the, 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 the Ceph Rook standpoint, uh, we, we understand we are um, Limiting in some areas, and in, in, in particular, we're, we're we're looking at a a there is no automation, right? When we're when we're looking at setting these 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 types of security principles on the on on Rook Ceph. we're looking at manual um, additions to 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 and changes to to anything required to enable these types of features. Anna, you want to cover the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you, Michael. So this is really state of the art stuff, and it's really important. It's amazing, Ceph is continually improving our security, as are, many of, as are many other places in industry. It's really good. It's not enough. I still have a job analyzing CVEs day to day. 
that bond rook is really good. It enables all the benefits of containerization. It enables a lot of security benefits, but it doesn't formally guarantee a whole lot. It's not bulletproof. We still get CVEs. What causes our CVEs and how could we reduce the number of them? Going from a whole lot of CVEs to just a few. So let's think about some of our sources of flaws and CVEs. Many of our flaws occur with access control and with buffer overflow attacks. I'm going to discuss these categories of flaws and then how to prevent them in theory and in practice. So access control. You know, we deal with this. We're dealing with a lot of stuff by applying permissions, checking user authorization, making sure our key management is set up. It hasn't eliminated the flaws. It has decreased the number of flaws down to about 1% under CWE 284, AKA improper access control in 2020. And it's a decrease from prior years, but these flaws still exist. We could eliminate these flaws if we had formal guarantees that state only certain users are authorized to access particular things. We don't have a formal bulletproof guarantee. We just have software that enables that and that roughly provides a general way to generally prevent these flaws. Another, the most common and overwhelming source of CVEs are related to buffer overflow and memory buffer attacks. This is 21% of our CVEs in 2019. These are entirely preventable with guardrails from overflowing languages, from programming languages. There is no need to have a buffer overflow in 2021. It happens due to the use of languages. And of course we fix them when they occur, but there are languages that prevent buffer overflow attacks. For example, Go and Rust. Go and Rust are both memory safe, meaning that you can't write to sections of memory that you don't mean to write to. They eliminate buffer overflow attacks. Just by having these guardrails from a programming language and taking a little bit of a technique that says that you cannot have this. You can design a system so that these attacks are impossible. Go and Rust have different benefits. Um, you know, Go obviously has garbage collection, Rust does not, and it all depends, but Rust can be a little bit faster, so it all depends on your goal as to which language you use. But we can eliminate buffer overflow attacks. Even with older languages, with C, you can have verifiable, verified compilers that do not allow security flaws. The biggest downside is efficiency. But as we're seeing, it's starting to be practical with languages such as Go and Rust being widely adopted in industry. These techniques are not just in the realm of theory. They're very practical. So how are we even enforcing security nowadays? On RHEL, we're using SE Linux and SecComp. And this helps, but it relies on user configuration, which as we touched on, can be a huge pain doing all of this manual user configuration. Containerization really helps to contain flaws and decrease their security severity, but alone, it doesn't eliminate the flaws. It reduces it, it provides a stopgap, but we still get CVEs. Again, we want to eliminate these security flaws eventually so that there are no more CVEs of these types. So how would we do that? Well, we really need to make it so that security is impossible to mess up. Again, we are very optimistic. We're making progress in reality, but we want to make this impossible to mess up. And we want to make it so that programmer errors don't lead to exploits. A programmer error should not just be a personal flaw, but it should be a flaw within your design. How do we make it so it's idiot proof? You can't mess up, you can't create a major security flaw. So we can do that using formal methods. Currently, we're the Danaides. We're bringing our buckets of water, our patches, to a sieve that pours it out day in, day out for all of eternity. Um, it's annoying. It's honest work to be fixing all of these CVEs, but it can feel repetitive. So what's our way to the future? I'm going to let Sean here speak about formalizing security and formal methods and ways to actually stop these at the source. We're no longer the Danaides. We're no longer having it flow out the bottom, but we're slapping on a CV, we're, we're going a little bit more than slapping on a CV effects here and actually fixing that entire bucket so that it's not just held together with the duct tape, but there's a nice solid glass speaker up there. And over to Sean. All right, thanks, Anna. All right, so um, we've been hearing this, this term, formal methods, uh, a bunch in this talk. And 
one might reasonably wonder, uh, what is that? What, what do I mean by formalizing? And why is this helpful? Um, and why uh, do we have these visions that one day this will you know, take us beyond the era of flex tape security? Um, so the, the essence of formal methods, uh, it's, it's a kind of broad uh, class of research uh, connected to programming language theory uh, and formal logic. Uh, the essence is that we're going to represent programs uh, and systems uh, in some kind of logical system uh, that is amenable to uh, mathematical proof. Um, so we're, we're going to uh, rigorously model our systems and uh, programs. Um, and what that means, uh, for instance, in the area of my research is that we can uh, define logical propositions uh, representing uh, the essence of some concept of security. Um, and so we can think of this as just a very rigorous way of specifying uh, what our system is supposed to do. Uh, and then ideally, uh, we then take that specification and uh, the fact that it's embedded in this formal logic and we actually build a logical proof uh, that guarantees uh, that for a given system, whatever property we've claimed we want actually does apply to that system. Uh, and then the very nice thing is that with uh, recent technologies, uh, we can, uh, we make these formal logics machine checkable. Uh, so, you know, it's not just that I wrote down in my notebook a proof that you know you take uh, you eyeball and say it looks right, um, but actually we can feed the uh, the proof into a, a machine that will say yes, absolutely, this proof holds. Um, now that is uh, a pretty high bar, and um, as I'll get to in a couple of slides, it's not always uh, it's not currently viewed as super practical to do this for large scale projects. Um, so for my part of this talk, uh, I also kind of want to focus on um, this secondary benefit of formal methods, um, that, which is that when you start thinking in terms of these logical systems and properties, uh, you kind of change the way that you think about security in a way that uh, even absent the formal proofs uh, can be helpful in understanding the nature of security in a system. Um, so we want to get beyond thinking about just um, individual exploits and examples of bad behavior uh, and we want to think at a, at a higher level, a more abstract level. Hit the slide. Uh, so we want to think in some sense in terms of abstractions. And this is something that as computer scientists, uh, we, I, I think, you know, most, most programmers have uh, some natural, natural ability to do this just by the nature of programming. Uh, certainly we, uh, we have many, many layers of abstractions in all of our systems. Um, and it, it's useful to just think more explicitly about what those abstractions are and what they do for us. Um, certainly, programmers, uh, you know, perhaps our end user or perhaps the programmers working on a system like Rook Ceph, um, rely on abstractions that are given to them by the programming language. Uh, they, we rely on uh, the idea that if I call Alec, I'm going to get a block of a particular size uh, that is sort of separate from everything else in the system. That's memory safety. Um, you know, I expect that if I write through a pointer to this block, I don't accidentally write into this other block. Um, that's an abstraction, and that makes it easier to, to write a program. But often, uh, those abstractions don't actually hold. Uh, Can you click twice, Anna? Uh, often, the programmer's mental model of, of what's going on in the, in the system has some holes in it. And um, there are all, all sorts of different places that these holes can exist. And uh, a lot of CVEs come from the fact that someone was thinking in terms of some kind of higher level abstraction and missed the fact that uh, underneath that abstraction, there's actually a, a much a lower level, more concrete system that's doing something a little unexpected. And, um, you know, the classic example that Anna referenced is the memory, uh, you know, the buffer overflow. Um, you know, the fact is that our buffers are not separate from one another. And in languages like C, you can do simple pointer arithmetic and jump from one to another and nothing will actually stop you, even though it's not legal. Um, and so these assumptions, we can almost think of as being in our trusted computing base. Um, and that's sometimes a problem because we aren't actually, uh, we, we shouldn't actually trust them. Uh, so if you hit the next slide. Um, what the formal methods community uh, will sometimes get into when we're talking about solutions to this is um, can be thought, some people find it a bit utopian. Um, 
It's the idea that we can uh, actually specify at, at all the layers of abstraction in a system uh, what things do and how they work. Um, and that gives the programmers working up near the top the ability to prove and then verify, um, or sorry, to, to specify and then verify exactly what their program is supposed to do. Um, and, uh, and then because the specifications for the lower levels uh, should also be verified, um, they are actually able to trust uh, that the abstractions they're relying on are going to hold. Um, and that's very important. Uh, you know, there's really, there's, there's been plenty of work done in specific programs being verified. Um, a flagship example is CompSer, a C compiler uh, that's verified. And, um, and the verification there is, well, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Um, it's not that it doesn't have security vulnerabilities. Luckily, with a compiler, you don't uh, you're, you're not, you know, running it actively on a production system. So maybe that's not as big a deal, but, um, you know, we, we, we sort of have the, like, you can verify a program. Uh, and there's also a lot of work being done in like mitigation of these, um, uh, abstraction breaking things, uh, in the, in the lower levels of our system. And that, uh, includes things like, um, hardware and software security mechanisms. Uh, you know, there's a whole movement toward uh, hardware that provides uh, security enforcement primitives. Um, there's also when when Anna is talking about um, programming languages feature pro programming language features that uh, exclude certain kinds of bugs, such as uh, memory safety and Rust and Go. Um, you know, these help us be more confident in the um, abstractions that we're giving the, the final programmer, uh, even without actually doing all the work of, uh, of specifying and verifying every level, um, which is a lot of work. Uh, you have to specify everything and then do a formal proof. And that involves, uh, you know, we have, we have good tools for writing those proofs now. We have things like Cock and Isabel Hall um, that are you know, proof assistants and let us do that in an interactive environment. Um, but it still is, it's a lot of uh, person months to verify even fairly simple programs. Um, and then, you know, you have to build up this whole system or you have start at the top and you make assumptions. Um, so often this is viewed as impractical. Um, maybe we'll do, be doing it someday. And in fact, there, there are some programs that are getting, uh, you know, close to making realistic uh, attempts at this. And there are many things um, that prove, you know, a core, uh, set of functionality. Um, one thing I want to call attention to is MicroV, a recent work uh, that does this with a um, fairly realistic hypervisor. Um, but, you know, given that this is not something that we're going to just start being able to do overnight, um, what what are some takeaways that we can do right now? Uh, if you hit the slide. Um, I think one of the big ones is just kind of on a, maybe a, a development philosophy level, um, starting to think in terms of these abstractions, uh, in terms of the properties that uh, we are depending on and that we are offering further users of our software. Uh, and, this, and this is where, uh, you know, if I want to connect this to Ceph, I might think, okay, so we have all these different security features uh, that are being offered to the end user. Um, but what are, what are the, what is the end user uh, actually using these for what, um, you know, can, can I write down a formal description of how the system should behave so that the end user can, uh, rely on that? Um, you know, if, if the end user were writing, uh, their own code that they were going to verify in this very rigorous way, and I were providing them with some axioms that they'll use in their proof, what would they want to assume? Uh, can you hit the slide? Um, and there is a whole uh, area of research around just writing these properties. Uh, I won't spend a huge amount of time on them now. Um, but like, for example, if we're talking about containers, uh, the sort of official way in the security literature to describe a compartmentalization system uh, where containers don't talk to each other uh, is something called non-interference. Um, actually, we use non-interference for a lot of different uh, purposes. But in, in this case, non-interference means you know, if I'm a container living in some larger system, um, well, maybe that larger system could be two different systems. Uh, and I can't tell the difference between them because 
the parts of the system that I can see, my own memory, my own storage, uh, between these two systems, it's identical. But, it, but other containers in the system might be doing who knows what, uh, right? They might be different from one another. Uh, so if I'm living in, in either of these environments and I can't tell which one, and then we execute for a while, uh, I should still not be able to tell the difference between uh, the rest of the system, you know, if I'm in system A or system B. Um, and that means, you know, that, that's just kind of an abstract notion, but we can think about what, about what that means. That means that if out there in that system there is an attacker in system A, but no attacker in system B, and I can't tell the difference, then clearly I didn't get attacked, right? And uh, on the flip side, if I'm an attacker and uh, out there in system A, there's some secret that I'm trying to uncover, uh, and if there's a different system secret in system B, uh, well, if I can, still can't tell which system I'm in after executing for a while, then I must not have discovered that secret, right? And by phrasing things in this way, um, it may seem kind of convoluted or, uh, you know, just like too abstract, um, but it, it means that we don't have to talk about specific actions like memory accesses or, uh, do, you know, things like that. And so um, we can actually capture a wider range of behaviors that lead to the leaking of data or the, the interference with uh, programs. Um, so you can get the slide. The other thing to think about with uh, this, well, so let, let's pretend that you've sat down for a bit and, and said, well, how would I show my system obeys this non-interference property? And you start thinking about like, okay, in uh, in a C semantics, if we step and step and step, uh, you know, these are the different steps we can take. And uh, at each of these steps, I want to say, well, I'm only reading from my own, uh, from the things that I'm allowed to see, and I'm only writing to things that I'm allowed to change. Um, well, we might, we'll pretty rapidly hit some circumstance where actually uh, this doesn't hold. This this property, as I've stated it here, is too strong. Um, and that's kind of intentional. Uh, this is like the utmost level of safety. Um, so if we want to think about applying it in practice, we need maybe to make it probabilistic because there um, the underlying mechanisms that Michael talked about uh, rely on encryption, and, and encryption uh, gives us probabilistic guarantees and not absolute ones. Um, and of course, many systems will have ways that containers are going to talk to each other, and so we'll need to model that, and it's not going to be this nice straightforward isolation thing. Um, but the really powerful thing about a model like this is it gives us the starting point to say this is the extreme of what security is, and now here are the ways that it doesn't apply, and we can uh, you know, build our model from there and hit the slide. Um, and then, you know, we can, we can talk about what kind of security guarantees we do and don't offer. And, um, so if, if I'm going to give any guidance as to, you know, how to use formal methods, uh, without really formalizing everything and just informally, uh, you know, getting value from these ideas, um, it's that, you know, you think about these abstractions and the way that you're relying on them, and you think about the abstractions that you offer, um, and you kind of do in your head an informal reasoning about what those are and, you know, why you believe that your security mechanisms are sufficient to, uh, to offer them. Uh, and then you can tell your customers that and you can have some new buzzwords. Um, you know, we, we all love a good security buzzword, and I'm frankly a little surprised that non-interference isn't one of them yet. Um, I'm sure the marketing people would love to slap that on your software if you have a reasonable belief that you can provide it. Um, but just by going through that process of thinking about security in this way, um, you have a kind of higher level view of the sort of security that you're trying to offer and the reasons that you might fail to offer it. Um, and that's even before you've started doing any real formal methods work. Um, and of course, as a formal methods person, I advocate for you to also do the formal methods work, but um, I'm a little biased there. Um, and then of course, the other thing is, um, you know, as this uh, talk is an example of, uh, it's good for developers and product people and security people and formal methods people to all be talking about the um, our, our own different perspectives on uh, on how to make systems more secure. Um, and, you know, I think that cross pollination is uh, going to be very valuable um, because at, at the moment in industry at large and academia, um, these are kind of very siloed 
uh, disciplines, and uh, we really could use more cross-pollination. Um, so I think that's it for this talk, uh, and we'll now take questions.